Good morning! How's it going? It's so nice to see you all here today, and we have beautiful blue skies outside, so we get a cheer for that. Thank you, now it's so good. The smoke is clearing. Thank you, Jesus. So we just have a few announcements today. Uh, first of all, Children's Church, just a reminder, we have expanded to include ages four and five through sixth grade. The nursery and nursing mom's room is open for self-service. And then youth service with me and Levi is starting up again on October 4th at 5 p.m. We are so excited to take your teenagers off your hands for a couple hours. We have missed them so much. So just a reminder, youth is for kids ages 12 through end of high school, whenever that happens. And there are uh, signs that need, forms that need to be signed in the foyer. So you can just grab those. You can also come talk to me if you have any questions. But we are so excited to see your kids again. And we have prayer groups Tuesdays at 10 a.m. and Wednesday at 6 a.m. in the prayer room. Um, as you're leaving today, the ushers will have a basket at the back that you can drop your tithes or offerings into. You can also do that on our website as well as the Life Church app. And then we have a, um, there is a nationwide prayer march coming up. It's um, Franklin Graham is leading a nationwide prayer march in Washington, D.C. That is this coming Saturday, the 26th. It is from 10 a.m. to noon. You can watch the live stream. We are going to have the link on our Facebook and everything, so you can find it super easily. And this is not a protest or a political event. It's just to pray about our country and for healing in our land. So let's all take part in that. That's something we can all agree with. And then we have the Nativity coming up this Christmas, which I am so excited for. It's going to be on Sunday, December 20th. If you are interested in helping out, you can see Evelyn. I'm going to have Evelyn wave right there. And then Evelyn, did you want to come up and do a, yeah, and Evelyn's going to come up and talk about it. So let's welcome Evelyn up here. And Vanessa. <laughs> Well, good morning. I am so excited. This is Vanessa. She is my, um, um, I want to say, yeah, associate. associate, soon to be director, hopefully. <laughs> um, and we are working fervently to get everything prepared for this year's live nativity. Um, um, you might see some slides behind us from last year's or previous years. We've been doing this for four years. And this is an opportunity for all of us as a church to draw together in unity to present the gospel of Jesus through his birth. And Dick Williams will be coming to narrate again. And Lynn Shaw and Jamie are going to be doing some of the music, but we will be having um, a choir doing two songs and um, caroling before. So if you're interested in music, we need people to see Rebecca Cox in the back. She's our lovely worship leader, one of them. And um, we are also beginning the program with the child's, um, with his, the kids from Sunday school singing a song. And we will have an announcer announcing that. And it'll be the beginning of our nativity scene this year. Sure. Yeah, so all of those of you that have already volunteered to help, we thank you so much. And we are looking for even more volunteers to help get this production underway and to see it out. And it just lightens the load on everyone the more 
people that we have come out to help. So thank you so much for all of those that are already stepping up. Um, some areas where we have needs, as Evelyn mentioned, uh, the children's song in the beginning, it's one song, but what it requires is a leader to work with the children starting October 1st during Sunday school to practice that song every Sunday, and then the night of the nativity to organize the children and to get them up onto the berm at the right time and to sing their song, lead them through that song. So we're looking for one person who would love to help the kiddos with that. We are also looking for help. Um, once we get our, ad our flyers printed, we're going to need help just passing out those flyers into the community. We have a list of all the areas, the locations where we drop off flyers and people post them for us. So we're going to need help just delivering flyers to the locations that we've already come up with. Okay, uh, one of the areas is also in prayer. Above all, all of us can participate in praying. You can see it's a big production, and over 500 people attended last year. We're hoping for more because this world needs to know Jesus. And um, all of you out there, there will be a list in the foyer of prayer concerns. And as the Lord just lays it on your heart throughout the day, any day, every day, uh, please just pray for all of the people who are to be involved and that God's anointing come um, on everyone. And there's other needs as well, um, logistics, and we hope and pray that any COVID um, experiences do not hamper in any way this production because this is the word of God going out to the community. Um, it, on that note, all of you who would have any interest in being actors, um, we have the king's entourage with the camels and the shepherds with the sheep, and uh, there might be one or two other needs. If you're interested in that at all, please sign up. It's just really a bonding fun moment. There are no speaking parts. You just get to walk <laughs> and, and do what they would do. Um, there you go. And we also have a hospitality group that provides cookies and hot chocolate and just warm greetings as people pass in front of our church to go watch the event. And that group is always looking for more help to get stuff ready in the kitchen and get it out. Um, and then with that group, we're also looking, we have to come up with nearly a thousand cookies. Um, and so this year, um, because of sanitary reasons, we are purchasing those cookies. Um, so we will probably be looking for some cookie donations from bakeries. If anybody knows anyone in that area that they would love to help ask for some donations for cookies. We will be, we will be COVID-minded, masks and gloves and any uh, hot chocolate and cookie distribution will be in containers, uh, the way a coffee shop would. Um, so, and the spacing, we're going to be in compliance. Um, there is one need, if anyone here is um, techie, <laughs> we would like to be able to be outside to uh, do a live broadcast and create a podcast of this event as well. Um, and this is the year to do it. Um, it. So if anyone would like to be involved in the sound aspect or the technical side of things or the lighting, Video. videoing, yes, uh, please see, uh, see either one of us and we can uh, sign you up and you can tell us what we need to do. Okay, then in conclusion, I can't tell you how exciting it is uh, for those of us who have been involved, just the um, excitement of sharing the gospel message. Jesus did come as a baby, but he came as our Savior, and he's coming back. Amen. This is the beginning for some people, and we, we are praying for salvation experiences. So please make that number one in your prayer list. And the um, prayer requests, the prayer requests are at the back for you to just grab one and kind of they give you cues on all of our prayer needs. All right. Thank you. Any
Any questions? <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Doesn't Eve Evelyn look nice with her director's cap on and everything? And <laughs> He is the part. Um, we're in John chapter 13 this morning, so let's turn there. Uh, John chapter 13, we're looking at verses 1 through whatever we can get to uh, today. Thank you for being here this morning and, and being a part and, and gathering together. Uh, I, I just believe that God has an impartation this morning. Uh, for us in his word he's already touched us by the spirit of God and gathered and united our hearts together as one um, but as we look at his word today and this incredible act that he did with his disciples um, I just believe that God's going to just come in and deposit something within you this morning yeah. and we all we all need this we all need what Jesus has for us today. And, and I want you to grab a hold of it. In every believer's life, there are pivotal, God-tipping moments that are etched in our mind and heart. Think about when you came to Christ and, and what that process looked like. Uh, all of us were away from God until we came to God, right? until he found us and and we finally gave it over to him and committed our life to him and said Jesus you're my lord forgive me of the past and 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 how many of you know that's when that new life started right there and uh for the remainder of our time in the book of John though there are plenty of these moments for the disciples so John chapter 13, let's just read through here our passage, and then we're going to go back. Jesus knew, in verse 1, and I'm reading out of the Passion Translation. Jesus knew that the night before Passover would be his last night on earth before leaving this world to return to the Father's side. All throughout his time with his disciples, Jesus had demonstrated a deep and tender love for them. Before their evening meal had begun, the accuser had already planted betrayal into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now Jesus was fully aware that the Father had placed all things under his control, for he had come from God and was about to go back to be with him. So he got up from the meal, he took off his outer robe, and he took a towel and he wrapped it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' dirty feet and dry them with his towel. But when Jesus got to Simon Peter, he objected and said, I can't let you wash my dirty feet. You're my Lord. Jesus replied, you don't understand yet the meaning of what I'm doing, but soon it will be clear to you, Peter. In other words, hold on. Peter looked at Jesus and said, you'll never wash my dirty feet. Never. How many of you know there's always one in the crowd? But Peter, if you don't allow me to wash your feet, Jesus responded, then you will not be able to share life with me. And Peter, exactly the opposite. So Peter said, Lord, in that case, don't wash my feet, but wash my hands, everything. <laughs> everything. I'm not going anywhere else without you. In other words, Jesus said to him, Peter, you're already clean. You've been washed completely, and you just need your feet to be cleansed. But that can't be said of all of you. For Jesus knew which one was about to betray him. And that's why he told them that not all of them were clean. Verse 12 says, After washing their feet, he put his robe back on, and returned to his place at the table. And he said, do you understand what I just did? Jesus said. You've called me your teacher and Lord, and you're right, for that's who I am. So if I'm your teacher and Lord, 
and have, and have just washed your dirty feet, then you should follow the example that I've set for you and wash one another's dirty feet. Now, do for each other what I have just done for you. I speak to you a timeless truth. A servant is not superior to his master. And in the Passion Translation, it says, an apostle is never greater than the one who sent him. Apostle means sent one. So, in other words, the one who was sent is never greater than the one who sent him. So now put into practice what I have done for you, and you will experience a life of happiness enriched with untold blessings. Father, we just thank you for your word today, God. Lord, we value your word. God, let it be uppermost in our heart and in our life. God, I pray that you would bring structure, that our life would come into the structure of the kingdom of God. Today, that we'll let things go that need to go. And Lord, we'll take on the mandate from heaven. We'll take on the mindset and maybe a new paradigm that we haven't seen before, God, that you are calling us to. I thank you for that. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. And Lord, just as we sang this morning, not only for your goodness, God, but for your power in our lives. The power of the Spirit of God in our lives. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. So let's go back here. Jesus knew that the night before the Passover would be his last night on earth before leaving this world to return to the Father's side. All throughout his time with his disciples, Jesus had demonstrated a deep and tender love for them. Now he longed to show them the full measure of his love. Before the evening meal had begun, the accuser had already planted betrayal into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Okay. Everybody take a deep breath. Okay. This was it. This was it. This, these are his words to his disciples, the ones that are closest to him. In this remainder of time, he only had one more day, basically, with them. The disciples and Jesus had celebrated many Passover meals together with their own families and friends through the years, but this one would resonate in their hearts for the remainder of their life. The words and actions of Jesus during this time would be the most impactful for his disciples. It was time where everybody needed to take their place and trust the plan of God even in a time where they just didn't understand everything that was going on. But they needed to trust him. Jesus knew his place and position in, in this last day on earth. He knew Judas took his place in this time. Peter needed to take his place with the right heart for his future. The rest of the disciples were kind of clueless. They were flexible, but I believe they were a little bit more trusting than Peter. Verse 3 says this, Now Jesus was fully aware that the Father had placed all things under his control. For he had come from God, was about to go back to be with him. So he got up from the meal and he took off his outer robe and took a towel and wrapped it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' dirty feet and dry them with his towels. How many of you know that this was the, the, the least of the least of the servants would do this in the household? The ones that were on the bottom of the to totem pole would do this in people's houses. I'm sure that Jesus, what was resonating in him too during this time, was a few days before this Passover meal, a close friend, and we talked about her, Mary, washed his feet with a costly balm in an act of worship. Here Jesus takes this same position with his disciples. How many of you know that 
God uses a person like Moses. And he does incredible things. You know, the Bible says that there was nobody let, that was like Moses in a, in a prophetic sense and with all the signs and wonders and all that. But how many of you know life had to go on past Moses? The children of Israel were, were impacted with the life of Moses, but how many of you know that there had to be a Joshua in the wings? There had to be somebody that came on the scene that entered into a leadership position. Elijah did incredible, powerful things on the face of the earth. And Elijah, before he was about to be taken up into heaven, he knew that somebody needed to take his place. How many of you know there was an, an Elisha in the wings? Here Jesus, knowing that he's got to go, that he's going to be sitting at the right hand of the Father, but he's going to pour out his Spirit in a mighty way. How many of you know that you as a disciple come into the place of what he gave us? It's powerful when you grasp a hold of what Jesus was doing with his disciples here. You know, you can bypass this whole thing in your mind and, and just say, oh, well, somebody else will do it. Dave Lepard will do it. Tiffany will do it. Stephanie Williams will do it. They're good at it. Richard Calcagno will step up to the plate. We know he'll do it. The big question is, what about you? What is God asking you today to do in the kingdom of God? And how many of you know that we all have a part with that? Nobody's left out. God doesn't look at somebody's life and look at it as purposeless. Oh, I just... They're just decorations on the cake. Really don't have anything, no purpose in their life whatsoever. We all have something to do. Amen? We all can step up. We're all called to be leaders in a sense that we lead people to Christ. We reach out and touch those around us. How many of you know there's a hurting world out there today? One of the greatest parallels here and one of the greatest things here that Jesus is doing is... He's is sowing the seed of servanthood. You know, if you love somebody, you're going to give from yourself to that other person. The greatest love gift that you can ever give God that has everything, He doesn't need anything. How many of you know He's self-fulfilled? He's eternal. He's all those attributes that we talk about all the time. He's omniscient. He's, he's omnipresent. Amen? He's omnipotent. He's, you know, eternal. He just goes on and on and on. There's no beginning, no end. What are you going to give Him that's going to please Him? Your heart. You're going to serve Him. God, what do you want? What do you want me to do? I wake up every morning and go, God, do I have an option today? <laughs> I'm so far into this now. <laughs> to turn back is terrible. What do I turn back to? And probably many of you feel the same way. It's like, man, I'm, I'm vested now. Where, where am I going to go? Go back to Egypt? Go back to slavery? No way. Amen. How many of you know we're going forward? Hallelujah. With that servant's heart, we're going to embrace the fact that God doesn't want to use us and abuse us like the enemy has. 
God wants to use us for His purpose. And those who humble themselves in the mighty hand of God, how many of you know God's going to exalt their life? He's going to raise them up into heavenly places with Him. He's going to show them who He is. He goes, there's my son. There's my daughter. They're stepping up. They're stepping up to the plate. He's just waiting for you. He's never pushing you away. Just mouth to your neighbor. He's not pushing you away. Some of the wives or husbands are like, I don't know, he might be, you know. <laughs> no. Man, his love goes way past your junk. Way past your issues. I'm going to get this message done, so I'm going to hang out up here for a little bit, okay? Now Jesus, before eating the meal, takes off his outer robe and begins to wash his disciples' feet. Dirty, nasty. And I, I bet you Peter had smelly feet. <laughs> I'll bet you. There's always one in the crowd. None of the disciples notice ever, it never even came to their mind of doing this for Jesus. Or it doesn't say. Could have, and we just don't know about it. They saw Jesus as the rabbi that would change the world. They, right now they have him up on a pedestal and they've vested their life. They've invested their life into this rabbi, into this, the son of the living God, and they, they're sold out for him. They looked at him as the chief physical and spiritual ruler who would revolutionize Israel to the top place during this time. Which is warped. Spiritual, yes. Physical, no. This act was way beneath his position as the Messiah. But Jesus began to wash the disciples' feet. In all of this, Jesus acted out a parable for the disciples. Jesus knew actions spoke louder than words. So when he wanted to teach the proud, arguing disciples about true humility, he didn't just say it, he showed it. Why did Jesus have to give this lesson? His disciples were arguing before this about who is the greatest among them going up to this point. And I think, I don't know, but, but, but reading the scriptures, I think there was a little competitive thing between John and Peter. Do you know in the Gospels that Peter had the majority of the influence in Matthew, Mark, and Luke? And then John writes his Gospel, I think, just to be competitive with Peter. <laughs> it was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, totally. But when, when, when John writes certain things about running to the tomb after the resurrection, notice in the scriptures that it said, and Peter came after the one who, who ran first and beat him. I think there was this competitive thing going on. But all the disciples before this time, they were saying, I'm the greatest, or I wonder who's the greatest. And Jesus had to clear some stuff up. In Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 through 28. John and James, and, and his, James' name is actually Jacob. 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 And so the passion calls him Jacob. But John and James... I wonder if they went to their mom and said, hey mom, would you go to Jesus for us? Would you, would you talk to him for us and see if we can sit at his right hand up in, up in heaven? 
So the wife of Zebedee approached Jesus with her sons, James and John. She knelt before him and asked him a favor. He said to her, I, you know, Jesus it was so patient through this process. Knowing what's going on here that he just didn't just shut up. Woman, leave me. You know, it, it's kind of... He said to her, what is it that you want? She answered, make the decree that these my sons will rule with you in your kingdom. One sitting at your right hand and one on your left. Jesus replied, you don't even know what you're asking. Then looking in the eyes of James and John, Jesus said, are you prepared to drink from the cup of suffering that I'm about to drink? And are you able to endure the baptism into death that I'm about to endure? They answered him, yes, we're able. And Jesus looked at him and he said, you will indeed drink the cup of suffering and be immersed into my death, Jesus told them. But to be the ones who sit at the place of highest honor is not mine to decide. My father is the one who chooses them and prepares them. The other ten disciples were listening to all this. And a jealous anger rose a, a, among them against the two brothers. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, called them to his side and said, Kings and those with great authority in this world rule oppressively over their subjects like tyrants. But this is not your calling. You will lead by a completely different model. Completely different pattern. The greatest one among you will live as the one who is called to serve others. I don't think Peter liked this. Because the greatest honor and authority is reserved for the one with the heart of a servant. For even the Son of Man did not come expecting to be served by everyone, but to serve everyone and to give his life in exchange for the salvation of many. So Jesus showed it in a way that illustrated his whole work on behalf of his own. Look at this parallel between his act of servanthood and his mission for mankind. Jesus rose from the supper and, uh, uh, and he rose from his place of comfort and rest. Jesus rose from his throne in heaven a place of rest and comfort. How many of you know that Jesus actually gave up something to come to earth and to live as a man? He had it all up in heaven. But now he was going to have to live with mankind, humanity, through all the messes. And I like to think of it this way. He not only came to earth and gave his life as a ransom in his death for us. But how many of you know he lived for us as an example in every way possible? Jesus laid aside his garments, taking off, of, taking off his covering. Jesus laid aside his glory, taking off his heavenly covering to come to earth. Jesus took a towel and girded himself being ready to work. Jesus took the form of a servant and came ready to work. Jesus poured water into a basin ready to clean and to wash us. Jesus poured out his blood to cleanse us from the guilt and penalty of sin. And Jesus sat down again after he had washed the disciples' feet and Jesus sat down at the right hand of God the Father after cleansing us. This act was intentional and it was revelatory for his disciples to fulfill their callings with a right heart. Not puffed up, not arrogant, not domineering, prideful or pompous, but having humility and the grace of God to change the then known world. Every good and well-intentioned leader wants to fulfill his calling. 
but also wants his students or disciples to keep going and excel way past the point where they left off. How many of you know there's going to come a day where I release this church and we transition to some uh, other thing that God has called us to? Retirement. At some point, it's going to happen where I transition this church and that person or couple that, that takes the church and, and enters into that leadership position, they have got to have a servant's heart. They've got to know our community. They've got to know the DNA of our church. They've got to have the platform for the responsibility of things being placed in their life and being trustworthy. Amen? To fulfill the call of God where God wants to take this church to the next level. Amen? And I'm praying with all my heart that they go way past what Kroll and I have planted in this place. That they go way past the vision that God has had for our life here being with this church and working with these incredible people that he's given. That's my heart's desire. That whoever takes that would take it to the next level and it would double and triple and expand to the place where it is, it's like it impacts our valley, impacts the state, impacts the Northwest, and impacts nations for God. Amen? I don't know when that's going to be. God knows. But Jesus was here doing this, and he said, they've got to have this servant's thing down. Because they won't. They're going to hit the wall otherwise. And how many of you know Peter hit the wall? See, success as a servant in the kingdom of God will begin with what God has done for you, but then it must progress to what God has done through you for others. That's what I know when somebody's really mature about. And, 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 they, and they start maturing and growing in the things of God that it's no longer about them. When they come to services, they're not like, gimme, 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 gimme. They're like, Lord, what do you want me to do today? Who do you want me to impact God with, with words of life, words of encouragement, words that will set people free? This isn't, how many of you know, this is never meant and never will be the Pastor Mike show. This is what God wants to do in our life. I just present the Word of God. It's your option to do something with it. Amen? Amen? A mature servant is not motivated by his or her wants, but is moved by the master's leading to be a blessing and to help others. There's four directions of servanthood. Just real quickly here. First one is serving God. How many of you know He's first and foremost? When we serve, we're serving Him first. Then we end up serving certain leaders that have been put uh, that, that we've been put under their authority and, and leaders that God has raised up. We serve leaders. Number three is we're serving, how many of you know we're serving each other? But really when it comes down to it, we're serving all. Serving God, serving leaders, serving each other, and serving all. Going on in the scriptures here, but here's the hiccup. And Jesus knew beforehand that, that Peter was going to rise up here. He knew. I believe that. But when Jesus got to Simon Peter, he objected. And said, I can't let you wash my dirty feet. You're my Lord. And you know what was said. How many of you know that Peter was impetuous? He was self-determined. He was extreme. He was type A. He was the, he was the you think type 
or act before you think type guy. He continually put his foot in his mouth over and over and over. Even when he got something right, he was rebuked within the first hour. He said, Peter, who do people say that I am? Peter goes, you're the son of the living God. And, and, then, and then Jesus commended him and said, flesh and blood hasn't told you this, but my father's revealed this to you in heaven. And then Jesus started to say what he was about to do and what was going to happen in his life. And then Jesus said, and then Peter rose up and he said, God forbid that this should ever happen to you, Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, get, me, get thee behind me, Satan. He blew it over and over. He was in, and yet Jesus looked at him by the Spirit of God and said, you are Peter. And upon you, I'm going to build my church. Wow. That just tells me that God likes people who are in movement, no matter what. Amen? I, I, I have a hard time with type A people. You might think I'm a type A person. I'm not. I make fun of type A people. I would be the competitive one like John with Peter. Because I can't stand that type of, you know, wanting control and you do it my way or the highway. They just, type A people, they just go down the highway and they they don't care if people are following them or not. They just go and they do it. Peter had to get what Jesus was doing right now. He needed to get this important point. Jesus said, if you don't allow me to wash your feet, then you will not be able to share life with me. Get that point. What he was saying, Peter, if you don't get this point of serving God and others, you can't fulfill your God-given destiny. You won't share life with me if you don't get this. See, being a servant leader in the kingdom was not an option for Peter. He knew that by Jesus setting this precedence in what he was doing here, I think there was something inside of Peter that Jesus washing the feet of the disciples that he knew that he would have to humble himself before people and do the same. Later on in Peter's life, and I want you guys to so grab a hold of this because Carola, she shared this with me. She, She read it out of the Passion Commentary. But later on in Peter's life, after the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus talks to Peter about his life and ministry. This was after the resurrection. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. He said to him, then tend my lambs. Take care of my little ones. Take care of the younger ones. Serve the younger ones. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Then shepherd my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, then please tend my sheep. And that word tend, again, has the definition of serving. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, listen to this, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. You did your own thing. And I was long-suffering with you. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and somebody else will gird you and bring you to where you do not wish to go. Now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. 
And when he spoke this all to Peter, then he looked at him and he said, follow me. Why? Why did Jesus, and this bugged me for a long time. It's like, Jesus, you made your point on the first one with him, saying, do you love me? How many times did, G, did Peter deny Jesus? How many times did Jesus say, do you love me? So Jesus asked Peter three times if he loved him. In essence, Jesus knew how to bring healing to Peter and remove the pain of his denial. Three times Peter denied Jesus, but three times he makes his confession of his deep love for Christ. By the third time, the the crowing rooster inside Peter had been silenced. And he came to a place of absolute humility. Later on, Peter solidifies the point that he got it. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, in the New American Standard, it says, You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders. In other words, serve them. You younger men, get the, get the point of being humble and allowing yourself to come underneath somebody else's ministry to guide you and to lead you. And all of you, you know what he says? Clothe yourselves with Humility towards one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Going on here, Jesus said to him in, in John verse, uh, chapter 13, verse 10, it says, Jesus said to him, you are already clean. You've been washed completely, and you just need your feet to be cleansed. But that can't be said of all of you. For Jesus knew which one was about to betray him. And that's why he told them not all of them were clean. How many of you know that Judas had the ability to choose righteously? His ability wasn't taken away just because it was prophesied. God in his foreknowledge knew exactly the choices that Judas would make. And and Jesus gave every opportunity for Judas to repent. until he partook of the bread at the Passover meal. The Bible says that he was given over to Satan when that happened. Did Jesus' love, did, did Jesus love him all the way through? Everybody say yes. He did. He loved him all the way through. But with foreknowledge, Jesus being a just and a righteous example, a fair God, a fair judge in a sense he gave Judas the time and opportunity to change his heart and direction for some reason there was a huge foothold for the devil in Judas's life and the enemy used it for his purposes you could be one you can be used one way or another in this life and how many of you know it's time to choose the right it's time to get right with God. And let me say this, as we come closer to the time when Jesus is coming back, how many of you know we need to be ready in our hearts? Live every day like he's coming back that day. Amen. But keep planning, keep going. You don't have to hunker down, just keep following Jesus. Amen. I heard about somebody who was, who was really uptight because last Friday Jesus was supposed to come. <laughs> you know, somebody has said, in all my calculations, Jesus was supposed to come last Friday. Everything that I've seen, and it put fear into people's hearts that heard that. But how many of you know you only fear something if it's going to go the wrong way? You don't have to fear when you know your heart is right before Him. Amen? 
When you've got that repentant heart, you've got that servant's heart, God, whatever you want, it's no longer your will, it's His will. It's no longer your way, it's His way. And you know it. How many of you have no problems with Jesus coming back tonight? We should all be there. It's kind of the hope, right? This, this is not our destination. The trouble that we see is not our destination. We are going to a better place. And it's going to be awesome. So Jesus defines his act of servanthood to his disciples. After washing their feet, he put his robe on and returned to his place at the table. Do you understand what I just did? Jesus said, you've called me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for that's who I am. So if I'm your teacher and Lord and have just washed your dirty feet, then you should follow the example that I've set for you and wash one another's dirty feet. Now do for each other what I've done for you. I speak to you timeless truth. I like the way the Passion puts that. A servant is not superior to his master, and an apostle is never greater than the one who sent him. So now put into practice what I've done for you, and you will experience a life of happiness enriched with untold blessings. See, in the Jewish tradition, it would have never been expected that even any of the disciples would have ever washed the master's feet much less the master washing his disciples' feet. But as an example, Jesus humbled himself in this act. And in the moment he humbled his humble, and in that moment, his disciples were humbled to receive the foot washing. Have you guys ever been in on a foot washing before? In any other church or place that you've been in? Uh, I've seen it in the transference of where a pastor steps down and the next pastor comes in and they actually, the, the older pastor got down and, and washed the feet of this new pastor that was coming in. And it was so humbling for the one who was getting their feet washed. Hear this man of God transitions humility everybody say humility Jesus felt and saw the struggle in his students of who would be the greatest of them he had to give them another paradigm or a reset of their minds for the pattern of having a servant's heart see greatness in the kingdom looks different than the world's idea Jesus talking in Luke chapter 16 to uh, some of the religious leaders. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. What we would look at as somebody who, oh man, they're a self-made man. They, are, they have built this little mini kingdom on the face of the earth. And, and look, at, look at what has been given to them and what they've done. God looks at, it's just self. It has no bearing on the kingdom of God. And he didn't want his disciples to come into that place of looking what the world would say is success. Looking at what the world would say, wow, they, they've really done something. He said, I want you to be a servant. I want you to humble yourselves before God and before men. What did Jesus say to the rich young ruler? He had everything going for him. He was young. I'm sure he was handsome. He could have funded Jesus' ministry for the rest of his life. He was sharp in business and had a sense of morality even. But he was found lacking. This rich young ruler was too full of himself and what he had acquired in this life. Because the Bible said, instead of following Jesus as one of his disciples, he went away from the encounter sad because he didn't want to give up his riches. 
How many of you know that you can't take it with you? So Jamie Colby says on Strange Inheritance, you can't take it with you. In other words, it's not an eternal thing. Whatever you acquire here, as far as material possessions, you can't take it with you. So it's important that we are sowing eternal treasures, amen, in this life. Because then it can go on, on planet Earth. When Stephanie Williams one day gives up this life and goes on, how many of you know that we receive an inheritance? Because she's a righteous seed. She sows in the eternal. If you get around Stephanie and she's in a good mood, (laughs) you're going to get the seed of joy. Amen? You're going to get an earful about Jesus' life and what he's done for her. She impacts my life in certain areas and challenges me. And when she gets sown into the earth one day, how many of you know? I can say, Lord, I want what she had. (laughs) Amen. You get around Jesus' people and you can grab a hold of their inheritance. That's good stuff. That's just for free. I didn't even have that. (laughs) This is what Paul said to the church in Rome, to the believers. He said this, God has given me grace to speak a warning about pride. Because pride is the opposite of humility, right? I would ask each of you to be emptied of self-promotion and not create a false image of your importance. How many of you know we need God? He doesn't need us. Somebody else, he can raise up somebody else if you don't answer the call of God. But he values you enough to say, hey, step up, I want to use you for the kingdom. And all you have to do is respond and say yes, and he said, okay. And he starts the process. But he needs your okay today. He needs you saying yes because he's not going to do something against your will because that's not true love. Right? Instead, Paul goes on here, instead, honestly assess your worth by using your God-given faith as the standard of measurement And then you will see your true value with an appropriate self-esteem. I like that. Last scripture verse here in Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And just just having the mind of Christ about this whole thing about servanthood. Just grabbing a hold of it and seeing what Jesus did. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy. Listen to this. Paul writing to this church at Philippi as he's in the deepest, darkest dungeon in Rome. He said, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And then Paul says this. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. Let this same mind. You can have the mind of Christ in this particular area and let it lead you down paths of righteousness. Listen to this. 
who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. He didn't spout off to humanity. Serve me. Look to me. He, he didn't do all that. He just was who he was. He was the son of the living God. When you know who you are in Christ, how many of you know you can affect the world that you live in? Let each of you look out not only for his own answers, but all the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every other name. How many of you know, one day, every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. He's Lord. And yet, he says, I'm your servant. Here are some challenging things that we can do just in a practical sense. Try getting through today without talking about yourself and what you're doing. Instead, ask others about themselves and what they're doing. Is the conversation always about you around mealtime? Are you promoting others in your life? If you're just talking about you, then you're a narcissist and you need to stop. Yes. Pastor Mike, that is true. Number two. Try listening to someone else's story without talking about the same thing that happened to you. A little practical things here. Do you always try to interject? No. But look, I know that sounds good for you, but listen to this. You're one-upping them. John Peter competition thing. Number three, once every day for the next week, help someone else get what he or she wants. And let it mean you're not going to be able to get what you want. All this needs to be in balance, too. Because you have things to do. I realize that. And there are things that God wants to fulfill. But it can't just be about you. Go to the church with the view of seeing what you can give rather than what you can get. And write down and journal these things. Just for fun. Servants are, everybody say, humble. Servants are reliable. Servants are trustworthy. And servants are obedient. There's a dual thrust of action with a servant's heart. Do unto others just like you would be doing it for Jesus. What did Jesus say? When you've done it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. How many of you know Jesus is watching? It shouldn't really necessarily pressurize you. That you just say, flow in what you know. In God's word, amen? Be a light. Be salt and light to this generation. And as doing, and doing as Jesus' hands and feet to humanity, to a hurting world, Amen? Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your word today, God. I thank you for touching people's hearts right where they're at. I know this is a challenging word, God. But just as you dealt with Peter, God, and even in his fallen state, Lord, you had already, already forgiven him. You saw this godly repentance in his life where he had had pride before, where he had just gone on the merits of his personality. 
But God, he had to recognize that it wasn't about what Peter would do. It's about what you wanted to do on the inside of him. And the life of Jesus could only be seen as he served others. Because Lord, he needed to love, not only love you, and love what you were asking him to do, but he needed to turn from a life of self. From a life of doing it his own way and give his life for the kingdom of God. Lord, there might be somebody like that here this morning. God, we have our own ways of, of just being self-centered and, instead of God-centered in our life. So God, I pray that you would get us into alignment today. God, withdraw what you need to in the areas of of self as we give those areas to you and and God we're asking that Jesus would come in and completely deposit that servanthood that seed of a servant to fulfill the call of God that's on our on our lives God that we would that we would go in, Lord, and not, not strive, but begin to come into peace and rest in the life that you've given. That we didn't have to strive after this thing and that thing, all the distractions of life, but that we just have to know you. We just need to know you, God, and what you want, your will and your ways in our life. Thank you for that. Thank you for that deep-seated root today that has been in self. Lord, that you have the power to uproot that thing. And replace it with the Jesus thing. Thank you for that today, God. Lord, I know that that's a huge thing in the lives of your people. I don't want to minimize it in any way. But Lord, it just takes a decision today. A commitment to go further in the things of you. To open up our hearts and say, God, we trust you. We trust you, God. Jesus is your way or no way. So God, we just, we give that area over to you today. And I thank you, Lord. I thank you, God. That you know exactly what's needed. Lord, we love you today. Thank you for touching each and every one of us. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody said, amen, amen. We're going to be up here uh, ready to pray for anybody who needs extra prayer at all today. Just want to tell you as a pastor, be ready. You know, because as I look, and some people don't even believe in this, and, and I get it because there are a lot of different ways to look at the time that we're in right now. But as I look at the Bible, I'm able to check mark boxes of what's going on. And I would not be a good pastor if I didn't tell you, be, please be ready. Please be ready. No matter what, you can't lose in being ready. And please don't name dates when Jesus is coming. <laughs> just say, I don't care, I'm just ready. Okay? All right.
See you guys.